On today's episode of the Cryptoverse, we're going to get an update on the development of the Lightning Network. We'll have a look at some good news from South Korea, so our friends over there can get back to trading cryptocurrencies. A new version of the Ethereum yellow paper is out, and we'll take a look at the Bitcoin price chart. All of that on today's episode of the Cryptoverse, so stay right there. Hi there guys, welcome to the latest episode of the Cryptoverse, your regular dose of news and commentary on Bitcoin, cryptocurrencies and blockchains. I'm your host, Chris Coney. So, Lightning Watch, first segment. Here's the Lightning Network visualized, link in the video description if you want to see this. Today's stats, what have we got then? Actually, I've got my spreadsheet going here so you can see what's going on here. Well, the last time I put an entry in this, it was 138 nodes. 329 channels and 231 million Satoshis of capacity, which is an increase of 42% since yesterday. Now, granted, those numbers change by the minute, but that's the snapshot I took at the same time today as I did yesterday, so we can trend it out. So a 42% growth in the capacity of the network in the last 24 hours alone. I mean, that's a ridiculous growth if it was maintained. In fact, this site that draws this graph for you, down the bottom right corner, there's a donation address that looks like a SegWit address, but then you can generate a Lightning invoice if you want to tip them with a Bitcoin via a Lightning payment. Pretty cool stuff, eh? And then what that looks like on that graph that I showed you the other day, link in the video description, you can see a visual line of how the network is growing, both in the number of channels and the capacity in terms of Bitcoin. Meanwhile, the fees on the main Bitcoin network, they've been dropping recently. You see this orange line goes down and down, 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 down. And right now, if we average it out over the last 24 hours, it's about 153 Satoshis per byte over the last 24 hours, which is way down from these averages over here, between 300 and 500 from last week. Oddly enough, though, over on the SegWit chart, SegWit has dropped below 10% usage, 10% of transactions. And that's today, pretty much, having hovered between 10 and 12% over the last week or so. Very interesting. And I said yesterday that I expect this to grow as the Lightning Network grows. However, today it's dipped in terms of SegWit usage. But that's, um, that's only just one data point for one day, so I'm not going to take much notice of that. We'll keep an eye on it. I'll do Lightning Watch every day to see it keep, continue to grow. And they're uh, coming soon to a wallet near you. The main story I wanted to talk about today is on South Korean Bitcoin regulation. So rather than an effort to outright ban crypto trading, the South Korean authorities seem more interested in making sure that trading isn't done anonymously. That's really their MO. I have no doubt that crypto trading volumes from Korea have dipped recently, and that's been a contributing factor to the falling prices in the same way that whenever we have one of those crazy days of gains, you look at South Korean volume and it's just like almost off the charts. Anyway, the South Korean government, they've come forward with the names of six major banks that are now willing to provide services to cryptocurrency exchanges. There is a catch though. The catch is the exchanges will have to share data about their users with the banks. So this includes both personal information and transaction details. So like the name on the bank account will have to match the name on the cryptocurrency exchange account and that will prevent anonymous trading, right? And that will aid in you know, anti-money laundering because you know exactly who's transferring the money to the exchange and then who's, who's the owner of that exchange account and so on. Now because this name matching is required, um, that's why the banks are having to share sorry, the exchanges are having to share data with the banks, right? It says in the article also that this new system should be up and running by the 30th of January, which is like just a week away, but there is a possibility that some of these banks may have it up and running before then, and uh, exchanges in Korea start allowing people to trade once again. The benefit to the government, though, is that they can also make sure that all the crypto activity is, like, taxed. So if they can't get the crypto trading information from the exchanges, they can now just get it through the bank instead, which is um, 
pretty tight system all all in, isn't it? So I suppose this is this is to be expected from a government. It's balanced in the sense that they're not just letting it run riot, completely unregulated, but neither are they completely outright banning it. So they've um, they've caused some waves in the market while the uncertainty is happening, but now some certainty is returning. Then this should bode well for the Korean market to get back into crypto over the next week, and certainly within within the by the end of seven days, when the thirtieth of January does arrive. That should bring all that Korean volume back and um, bring some normality back to the crypto markets, whatever normality is. I mentioned earlier that there's this new version of the, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, the Ethereum yellow paper. So this document is the formal definition of the Ethereum protocol, and it was originally written by Gavin Wood. And it says here it's now maintained by Nick Savers and his contributors from the community. So if you like getting back to fundamentals, or if you've never even read this paper before, then I'll leave a link to it in the show notes. At 37 pages, it's relatively short, and it is actually on yellow paper, would you believe? Now this version is dated the 22nd of January 2018, so it's right up to date. Just be warned, this is a very technical document with a lot of math formulas in it. But um, even if you don't understand the math formulas, like I don't, for example... I'm still going to read through it because I will get some knowledge out of the text-based conceptual explanations, right? I don't necessarily have to understand the math to understand the conceptual um, points in the 37 pages. So I'm still going to read it, despite the fact I'm not an advanced um, math graduate. And then let's take a very quick look at the Bitcoin price chart. I must apologize. Yesterday, I clearly was the victim of, I guess, buy-side bias. Um, This is fundamentally why people have real trouble learning to trade financial instruments because the the human mind has this ability to project, meaning you see what you want to see. And no truer is that than looking at a price chart. So yesterday, I was the victim of wanting to see bullish signals, when in fact, objectively speaking, I've now drawn them on there. This is a descending triangle, right? So here's the support line around $10,500. But then you've got this definitely definite trend of lower highs, which is reasonably bearish. Even the 50-day moving average is starting to turn down, and the price is in between the two moving averages. So in psychology, your brain will either delete, distort, or generalize information so that you see what you want to see, right? You'll interpret what's coming into your eyes in ears uh, in such a way that it fits what you already believe, right? So that's the deletion, distortion, generalization thing. So if, if yesterday I wanted the price signals to be bullish, then anything that would suggest bearish move, any data would suggest that, that the price was going to move down, my brain would delete that, if you know what I mean, put it off to one side, and then not serve it up to my consciousness. So that I looked at the chart, and I genuinely believed at that moment in time that it was um, looking positive. And... Um, it's just it's just a the plight of having you know a, a consciousness that's confined to a single brain right it's um it's very hard to be objective when money's at stake and so on anyway so that's why it's hard to learn trading and do it consistently even professional traders are the victim of those distortions deletions and general generalizations if they weren't they would be able to consistently make money every single day which they don't right some days they have a bad day and then uh they're the victim of those psychological phenomena and make mistakes because then when they come back to the chart, they go, oh, why didn't I see that? Because they, you know, they were temporarily overcome by some sort of bias or other. Anyway, what I'm seeing now, though, is this descending triangle, right? The support is, I say, at 10,500, which is actually trading below that right now. The low that we had at the bottom of the major crash was 9,231. That's below the support line that I'm talking about. And then what we do know, though, is that this downtrending lower highs line is looking pretty bearish from the top at 20,000. So I'm not going to do anything right now. I'm still holding the positions that I got into when we had the major crash because I've still got into some fairly decent prices there. So I shall hold. Given that we just spoke about the career situation, my expectation, and this is only my expectation, is that once the Koreans get back into the game, 
then that volume will then bolster the price again. And if we start seeing consistent gains, that will gain momentum as everyone else gets confidence back in the market and then um, we'll be back up again, right? So I'm using not just the chart this time, I'm saying that that fundamental news should bolster more volume, bring the volume back to the market and that should be enough buying pressure to take us up, right? So despite the fact that I've, it sounds like I've just done it again, I haven't, the chart seems bearish, but that cannot be the master. That, all, that should always be the slave. The master should always be reality and news and fundamentals. So the chart can't tell us about the career situation, can it? So that is something that cannot be predicted by the charts. But if you know about it, right, when the chart changes, you can understand what happened in the world to cause that, right? So that's the way I'm going to leave it for today. All right, thanks very much for joining me today, guys. If you like this episode, go ahead and hit that like button. And if you're new around here, get subscribed. And if you would like access to my very best material, check out my website. It's cryptoversity.com. You can go there, click on the courses page and take any one of these online courses. Or if you would like to learn from me in person, in London in February, I have these two live events. One is just a simple evening talk and one is a one day crypto investing workshop where I'll teach you in person from scratch, set you up with a hardware wallet, set you up with Ethereum-based token investing, and teach you all the best practices that I use myself. So not long now, you've only got till the 10th of February to book the one-day workshop, or the 3rd of February to book the, the live talk. So get on over there and uh, book a ticket if you want one. Other than that, guys, I'll be back tomorrow with another episode of the Cryptoverse. So until then, it's me, Chris Coney, saying... Bye for now.